Hi there, my name is Michael Barber and I'm an assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And you are at the panel for the State of the Nation study, K-12 Online Learning in Canada. The State of the Nation project has actually been going on for four years now and began uh, back when INACO was actually still the North American Council for Online Learning. Um, and you can see back in 2008 with that first one, we called it a snapshot because it was a brief overview of what was going on in the country along with a more in-depth profile of three provinces, Newfoundland and Labrador, Ontario and British Columbia. It wasn't until 2009, which is the green top there, that we actually had a complete national survey. And it was also the first year that uh, we were able to get some sponsorship in the form of Connections Academy. Uh, last year, we were able to expand upon the report again, adding a new feature with the brief issue papers. And uh, we are also able to add K-12 Inc. and Desire to Learn as sponsors. That brings us to this year. And first of all, before I get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Connections Academy, which has been with the State of the Nation Project now for three years in a row. And we can continue to value their uh, their sponsorship of this report. Uh, this year we were also able to add Heritage Christian Schools out of British Columbia as well as Digital Inc. and I thank both of them for joining uh, along with the input that I received from individuals from all three organizations in the planning preparation of the study along with the writing of the report. To give you, I guess, some sense as to the background as to where this report came about, you'll notice in that first year we relied primarily upon a few key stakeholders in some of the provinces, uh, very heavily upon document analysis that we were able to get from individual ministries of education and as well from government websites. Along with uh, British Columbia was actually the only Ministry of Education that formally participated in that first year. You'll notice as we started to gain some sponsorship and had the ability to uh, do things in a more formalized manner, we got a much more participation from the Ministries of Education beginning in 2009. And you'll note that in 2011, this year, was the first year that we've actually been able to get, get participation from all 13 ministries of education. So we were quite pleased with that. Looking at, I guess, where we are in terms of a country, um, there are, I guess, four types of or four categories of regulatory regimes that you will find throughout Canada. Uh, the first is a legislative regime, and that's present really in British Columbia and in Nova Scotia. And in the case of British Columbia, it's through a couple of pieces of legislation and then a substantial amount of regulation that is attached to that legislation. Um, British Columbia is actually the, the most heavily regulated uh, province with when it comes to the act of, of distributed learning learning as they call it in British Columbia. Um, in the case of Nova Scotia what you find is actually language that appears in the contract that the government of Nova Scotia has with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union that governs most of what occurs within that province. A step down from that you've got three provinces that have substantial policy regulations that are put out by the ministries of education. In the case of Manitoba and New Brunswick it's issued directly by the Ministry of Education. In the case of Ontario it's done through uh, an organization within the ministry known as eLearning Ontario. And while the regulations are different in each of these three provinces, it's, it's fairly substantive. Uh, there are four provinces that really don't have much in the way of regulations at all, those being Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Interestingly, it's actually in Saskatchewan and Quebec, there used to be regulations similar to what you would find, say, in Manitoba right now. Although in the past decade, in both instances, the ministries of education there have devolved that responsibility to the school districts. Um, Alberta, which was one of the early adopters of K-12 online learning, really doesn't have much in the way of, of regulation when it comes to distributed learning there, although there are a number of uh, new policy documents, the Inspiring Action in Education series, and as well amendments to proposed amendments to the Education Act that are starting to move that province more along a blended learning model, which if these things are actually enacted, could make Alberta actually a really exciting and interesting place to keep an eye on. Looking at the three territories as well as Prince Edward Island, in these instances there's some reference to distance education 
in the Schools Act or the Education Act or ministerial directives in each of these jurisdictions, but the majority of regulation actually comes from individual memorandums of understanding that, say, the territories have with programs in British Columbia or in Alberta, or in the case of Prince Edward Island, programs that they have in New Brunswick. Now, I don't want to give the impression that regulation somehow equals activity, so that a heavily regulated jurisdiction has a lot of activity or the amount of regulation actually stymies activity. Similarly, that a jurisdiction that has no regulation either has little activity going on because of the lack of re regulation or um, is an area that is, is tremendously growing because there are no uh, burdens to that growth because there really isn't that much of a correlation. If you look, for example, at Newfoundland and Labrador, where the Center for Distance Learning Innovation, which was created about a decade ago, for the last six to eight years has really had a strong and consistent presence in terms of the number of students that it services and the number of courses that it offers. But that was a jurisdiction that had no regulation. Similarly, Saskatchewan, um, a couple of years ago, the ministry decided to devolve all responsibilities for distance education to the districts. And just over a dozen of those districts actually um, have created their own programs to offer distance education, not only to their own students, but to students throughout the province. Uh, having said that, on the opposite end of the scale, British Columbia, which is the most heavily regulated province in the entire country, also has the greatest proportion of students engaged in K-12 online learning. It's about 12 or 13 percent right now of students in that province will take one or more distributed learning courses. So you see there's a great variety there, but in looking at the types of programs, um, Newfoundland and Labrador and New Brunswick have single province-wide programs that are managed directly by the Ministry of Education, um, usually by a unit. Um, in the case of, of Nova Scotia, they have a provincial-wide program, actually several. They've got a, a correspondence model, the Nova Scotia uh, Virtual School. They also have a... Um, um, uh, 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 interactive television model that they're they're still using a little bit of, or video conferencing model, sorry. Um, and but at the same time, they have a number of districts because the Nova Scotia Virtual School was kind of a broker, and the districts would actually offer up their own um, distance ed programs using uh, the NSVS materials. In the case of, of Quebec, you've got primarily district-based programs, although they've come together and, and, and kind of form consortium. So you've got LEARN, and you'll hear from Michael in a, in a few minutes on the panel about that program, which services most of the English language districts in the province. Uh, SOFED, which is a, a correspondence program that is working with about 70 of the districts. I think it's 66 of the districts. Um, and then you've got the remote network schools, which uh, does some video conferencing work. In the case of Ontario, you, again, you've got Got primarily district-based programs, although in Ontario you also have th four, three, sorry, three um, private schools um, that are offering, and then another private school consortium. So you've got um, three private schools that are completely online, uh, those being the Kiwetinik, Ottawa Carleton, and uh, Virtual High School Ontario. But you also have a consortium of traditional brick-and-mortar virtual schools sorry, traditional brick-and-mortar private schools that have come together to start offering some online courses amongst each other. Um, in Manitoba, you've got uh, province-wide programs, but the districts also have the ability, and a number of them have taken uh, the province up on that in terms of offering their own programs. Uh, I've mentioned Saskatchewan and British Columbia already. Alberta actually has a province-wide program in the um, Alberta Distance Learning Center, uh, which also runs the Vista Virtual School and a French Immersion Virtual School that is kind of province-wide in scope. But then there's a, a number of uh, private and public district-based programs throughout the province, um, and we've got some representatives here uh, from uh, British Columbia and Alberta and Ontario to join Michael on the panel. Um, and in the case of, of what you find up north, uh, while most of these areas have smaller uh, video conferencing programs, similar as Prince Edward Island, where they're offering one or two or three courses through video conference, but the majority of their distance ed is happening from Alberta or from British Columbia or from New Brunswick. Um, I should also note that in the Northwest Territories, the Beaufort Delta Council, uh, the Beaufort Delta Education Council, has just set up an online program 
uh, which is offering a couple of courses this year to about 20 students as a pilot to see how that goes. So that's sort of an overview, and like I say, I wanted to make it quick because I want to give time for our panel. You can download the reports, um, all four of them, off of the iNACL website, and I believe there are some available to be picked up at the conference. And if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me at um, my email address there, my webpage, or you can always um, follow my blog where I talk about these kinds of issues. And now I'll turn it over to Greg as he chairs the panel.